Hi guys, welcome to Human Anatomy and Physiology. I'm your instructor, Mr. Doherty, and I'll be guiding you through the topic. Um, I hope I can infuse in you the same enthusiasm I have for the subject matter. I've been teaching it now for about 20 years, and uh, of course I had lots of undergraduate and graduate study in, in the course as well, and some professional experience to boot. And, uh, you know, anatomy and physiology, of course, is is fascinating, you know. Um, what's more important than your health and understanding um, your your place here in the physical world? You know, I, I teach a lot of other science courses, so we're going to be incorporating uh, chemistry into the course and physics into the course and environmental science into the course. Um, it's a terrific subject. Everybody's got a story about uh, <laughs> their own personal experience in the world and uh, a, a we're going to spend a lot of time talking about things that are interesting to you and stuff that's uh, less interesting. I'll do the best I can to, to, uh, to help you navigate through the material. Um, when we talk about anatomy and physiology, we talk about structure and function, structure and function. And, uh, you know, the more you know about anatomy and physiology, um, the more intimately prepared you are for your um, passage through time. Um, so I'd like you to take a second and, and think about how things have changed for you as you've uh, emerged into adolescence and young adulthood. Um, you know, what are the, some, some of the changes you've gone through? And, uh, you know, what are the pluses and the minuses? This photograph here is, is a little bit unsettling, and I, I think that's one of the things that's... Um, true about your deep understanding of your physicality um you know the, the fact is that we are uh, we are physical beings and that uh, we have a finite time here and uh, you change over time and as you get older you you find those changes more profound and of course when you talk about anatomy and physiology um, it brings up a lot of deep philosophical uh issues so if, um, you know, there's, there's a branch of philosophy called mind-body dualism, okay? So uh, um, who am I and uh, what is this phenomenon that I'm participating in? It's the biggest question. What the heck is going on? It's the big, the big question that science doesn't have an answer to, okay? And uh, I know that when you're 17 or 18 years old, um, those were the kind of thoughts that dominated my thinking. Wow, what a, what a strange experience this is. Hopefully, um, I can inspire you uh, to, uh, you know, bring some of those awesome feelings about the nature of the physical world into the coursework. Uh, of course, uh, those awesome feelings also can bring about fear. And this picture should be fearsome. Uh, this is a dissection and... Uh, you know, remember that this, the, the course is all about anatomy and physiology, structure and function. And you can see uh, that uh, there's been a dissection here of somebody's skull. And there's a bunch of teeth buried in there, which is interesting. And of course, um, you know, understanding of anatomy and physiology is as much a cerebral experience as it is a visual experience. All right. So early anatomists spends lots of time um, doing diagrams and dissections. And we'll be doing the same thing in the course. You know, this, this photo is a little misleading. Um, it's been kind of scrunched up to fit the, uh, the slide. Let's, let's look at the original photo. So this is the original photograph at its appropriate dimensions. And um, you can see there's a change in the uh, proportions here. And uh, that should give you some indication um, as to the age of this skeleton. In the previous slide, you, you might look at it and see the, the skull of an adult. And, and here you, you might want to say, wow, these, these proportions don't look like an adult's proportions. And, and that's because they aren't. This is a... This is a, a, a a, a young person's skull, probably toddler, um, I don't know, six, seven, six, seven years old. And you can tell that uh, 
we have these emergent teeth, these these teeth that have emerged out of here. And if you if you have little brothers or sisters, if you have pictures of yourself, you know one of the things um, that's always kind of spectacular with emergent teeth. You know, you go you lose your baby teeth, and then you get these new teeth, and they they start off with these beautiful little florets on the top. These uh, extensions of the tooth they get worn down pretty rapidly um, and of course you've got these other teeth buried in the skull one of the things that's fascinating uh, about this is that um, that um, when those teeth emerge there's some important psychological developments that that uh, that fall in concert with that and um, Piaget the psychologist was the guy who looked at developmental sequence and we'll work some psychology into this uh, this course um, and uh, you know when those when those uh, when those baby teeth come in finally, or when those baby teeth are replaced finally, you start to you start to become logical. All right. So uh, at six or at uh, at two, when the teeth first emerge, those baby teeth come in, you 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 lose or you become uh, capable of concrete thought, and uh, and then when you're uh, you lose your baby teeth, you start to be able to be logical and pre-logical. Of course, when you're in adolescence, you start to uh, move into adult type of thinking. And uh, uh, the data comes in uh, saying that most of you guys really aren't going to be psychologically mature until you're about 25 years old. And that's when you'll have full executive functions, all right? So uh, that being the case, uh, forgive yourself for any mistakes you make. That's what kids do. Well, what is anatomy and why do we study it? Uh, well, it's a science. And of course, the, the obvious answer is like, what's more interesting than me? And uh, the, uh, you know, um, anatomical science is uh, very intimate for us. I mean, we started off as hunter gatherers. So uh, we learned all about an, anatomy by uh, the animals we hunted and, and killed and ate. And, uh, of course, it must have been obvious to our ancestors even hundreds of thousands of years ago that we share a lot in common with our our, uh, our animal friends. And, uh, of course, understanding how we operate is, is really important. In fact, one of the things I studied when I was in college, in addition to the biological science, was art. And so, uh, you know, artists and, and scientists have a lot in common. Both have to be careful observers, both, both uh, required to to focus intently on their subjects and uh, both are trying to model model the real world and so i've got a couple of examples of of art here um the art on the right that underlies this is actually that's just like some rotten old room somebody got in there and painted they painted some some ducks up there and took a series of photographs it's kind of fascinating in fact these gifts are uh, a new art form in my opinion and then of course off to the left here in the inset, I have um, some early anatomical sketches done by a very famous artist, okay? Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm going to hope you know who this guy is. He was a famous, uh, he was the Renaissance man incarnate, Leonardo da Vinci. And da Vinci was fascinating. In addition to being, uh, you know, one of the great artists of, in history, he also was really interested in sciences. And he was also an engineer, so he designed war machines. Guy's a fascinating, he's a, he's a fascinating guy. Uh, you know, made a living traveling around Europe and uh, living with kings. Um, and so those are some of Leonardo's sketches. And, and uh, you know, dissecting bodies has never been a popular uh, popular <laughs> pastime. And, uh, but Leonardo did it. And uh, we'll do some dissections as well in the class um, to help us understand this relationship between structure and function. All right. And that brings us to our next slide. What is anatomy? What's well, the study of the body structures? And uh, we have lots of names. This is a vocabulary course. It's a vocabulary course. And I'm going to try to teach you some some strategies to acquire new vocabulary and uh, and. Uh, and and and, uh, and and mnemonic devices to help you process information. If if you think you want to go into the into one of the allied health sciences, biologists spend a lot of time 
memorizing content, and uh, we'll do that in anatomy. Now, in physiology, it's how things function, and this is where things get a little bit deeper, and uh, so we'll study how things work and those relationships, and of course, one of the themes that I develop over the course is, is pathophysiology, how, how, um, how changes in normal physiology affect uh, the organism. Well, here's a good example of anatomy and physiology. Um, what is this structure down in the lower left inset? What is what is that? What is that? It's obviously some internal organ. I'll give you a hint. Ha! Ah! Yeah, it's the vocal cords. Yeah, that's an endoscope. An endoscope is this tube you shove down people's uh, mouth into their trachea. And uh, what you're seeing down here are vocal cords. They're made up of some dense connective tissue. They re reside right here, just on top of the trachea, in the structure called the larynx, a.k.a. voice box. The back of the throat here is called the pharynx. And then we have the oronasal cavity. All right. And so uh, one of the things that humans do that makes them unusual is they use language to communicate with one another. And in fact, there's some genes associated with the, the location of this larynx that seems to be indicative of the uh, of complex language. All right. So if you look at Neanderthals, there's some indication that their genes didn't allow for this, or maybe they had less control. Of course, one of the one of the uh, defining characteristics of Homo sapiens is a complex language. Uh, of course, that's in concert with the big brain. And uh, your larynx, um, your vocal cords allow, while well, they work this way, air is pushed up by your lungs through this space here. And uh, you have muscles connected to the soft tissue here that can stretch those vocal cords or relax those vocal cords. And as air brushes past them, it, it causes them to vibrate. And then you can manipulate that sound that's already vibrating in your oral nasal cavity by moving your tongue around, moving it up against your teeth or the hard palate up here. Of course, if you have a bigger sinuses, you might have a deeper voice. And if you have a longer larynx, you might have a deeper voice. And of course, if you're a soprano, this is going to be a short distance here. Anyway, I make sound and I can ma manipulate the sound and, uh, and then uh, I can do some cool stuff with it. You know, since this is a taped lecture, I'm not really doing this to you, but let's assume we're in the classroom. And so the question is, is what am I doing with my vocal cords and what's that doing to you? And the answer is uh, I'm vibrating my vocal cords and I'm shaking the air in the room. Of course, we've created this electronic technology that's doing the same thing. There's little magnets inside of a, uh, sealed containers with cones on them and that magnet moves up and down and it bounces against this cone and it makes airwaves too. And uh, anyway, those airwaves penetrate the the outer ear and they move through this thing called the auditory meatus, the external ear canal. And, uh, and then uh, that vibrates the tympanic membrane. And when the tympanic membrane vibrates, it moves these little bones, these ossicles, and they bounce against the uh, this organ of cortier, this cochlea, and uh, that energy is transduced. It's changed, and uh, it's turned into the sensation of uh, audition. All right, so you you have an auditory nerve here, and this is how hearing occurs, and that's going to be the subject of our next lecture. Just just the uh, the anatomy of the uh, the apparatus that allows you to hear, and I got a little activity for you to uh, do some anatomical identifications, and uh, maybe we'll talk a little about a little bit about uh, energy transformations as well. See you in a bit.